Welcome everyone to Alaska Quarterly Review's reading series available on the Alaska Quarterly Review YouTube channel. Please feel free to watch any of our prior programs and to share them. Alaska Quarterly Review is committed to presenting these programs without charge and to showcase vibrant and diverse new and emerging voices and literary conversations with depth and complexity and humanity. I am Ronald Spatz, Editor-in-Chief of Alaska Quarterly Review, and before we begin, I'd like to make a few important acknowledgments. Alaska Quarterly Review acknowledges the Anchorage Museum for hosting and providing technical support for this event, and to the Center for the Narrative and Lyric Arts, Alaska Quarterly Review's 501c3 umbrella organization, which makes this event possible. I also want to make a land acknowledgement. Alaska Quarterly Review recognizes the indigenous land on which all Alaskans live. AQR is located in Anchorage, and Anchorage is Denina homeland. Denina is the language spoken by the traditional, present, and future caretakers of this land, and land acknowledgement opens a space with gratefulness and respect for the contributions, innovations, and contemporary perspective of indigenous peoples and marks our collective movement toward decolonization and equity. And now to today's program featuring poet Maria Zicola. Maria Zicola is the author of the poetry collection, Helen of Troy, 1993, that is forthcoming in January, 2025 from Scribner and available to pre-order on Amazon or on Scribner's website. In addition to this debut collection, Maria's work has previously appeared in Alaska Quarterly Review, the Atlantic Plowshares Kenyan Review, the Massachusetts Review, the Iowa Review, the Missouri Review, the Suwannee Review, New, New Letters, Four-Way Books, Fence, and elsewhere. And her poetry has been featured on Poetry Daily and received a special mention in the Pushcart Prize Anthology. In a re recent interview with the Suwannee Review, Maria said this about imagining the Homeric Helen as a dissatisfied housewife living in a small Tennessee town in the early 1990s. I'm sure I brought Helen's story to Tennessee, she said, because I belong here and so does this version of Helen. She belongs to her community and is of her community despite the ways her community questions and rejects her and the way she questions and rejects her community. No doubt this reality is familiar to any of us who have found ourselves othered by and in the places we call home. And yet home does not leave us even when we leave it as Helen does not for a period of time with her lover, Paris. In my book, and in the original mythology, that absence cannot be permanent. She returns regardless of the consequences. It is my pleasure to welcome Mary Zicola. Thank you so much, Ron. Um, and thank you to Alaska Quarterly Review and to the Anchorage Museum. Thanks to Danny for tech support. Um, it's an honor to be here being part of this reading series today. Uh, like Ron mentioned, I'll be reading some poems from my debut poetry collection, Helen of Troy, 1993. It's not out yet. It'll be, it'll be out January 14th, 2025 from Scribner. Pre-order links are available on my website, mariazicola.com. Um, I'm holding in my hands right now a very, very, very early galley copy. I wanted to show off the cover because I am obsessed with it. Um, I think it's so gorgeous. Um, I think what I'll do for this reading is read a couple of poems from the book and then maybe pause for a few minutes and chat about the book a little bit and finish off with a couple more poems. The first poem I want to read is called Helen of Troy is asked to the spring formal. Every bird in the sky begged to be my man. Each worm in the dirt longed to wife me. When I swam in shallow creeks, leeches encircled my ring finger in black bands. I shimmered with the magic of hair or ankle, 
some perfection of sex that bent to my neck and powdered down, cutex sharp at nails and toes, coats of flashing fuchsia frost. Rats swarmed from their roofly nests, deer massed in the leaves before my blind, and then came the boys, pickup trucks and heavy bass, paper cups to hold brown spit. They snarled and swore and muddied the lawn. They bloodied the lawn. They held each other and rutted in the lawn, sun scald sweating them dry, undershirts yanked off, rivers of skin like the milk of my own hunger. I took their gifts. I counted them. Dolly on vinyl, Dolly on cassette, Remington bolt actions and tripods of gold, mud covered Jeeps with half paid notes a basket of rags with a signet inside. They offered themselves, their mother's farms, their father's bread, their bodies new spun from childhood clay. Come down to us, they howled to my window. We'll pelt you like the forest fox. We'll strip you clean. We'll lick you raw. You'll see why trees lie down for the axe. I listened. I went. I never came back. The next poem I want to read is called Helen of Troy Catalogues Her Pregnancy Cravings. Pickles. Peanut butter off a spoon. That cereal with the little blue guys on it, the gnome things and hats. They have the cartoon where they're all men, except for that one blonde babe who struts around in white Manolos and a flirty little slip and all the blue guys beat each other to death over her. a blue guy massacre, a real grisly piece of television. Although maybe I'm getting it mixed up with something else. Maybe I fell asleep watching it and kind of dreamed the rest. Maybe what I'm really craving these days is violence. Or maybe it's still chocolate, corn chips, sliced watermelon, microwave pizza rolls, bags of gummy sharks, ice cream, like a lot of ice cream, cartons of fudge ripple I pound in one sitting with a spoon like a dirt mover, scoop, scoop down the hole, layers of white ounces plugged right into the skin. Who was that one wizard in Salem they squashed to death in a tofu press? Giles somebody, they just kept piling it on and that sucker smiled his bluebird smile and asked for more. Cheesecake jelly rolls. I'm trying to weigh myself down and the kid's not doing it fast enough. A house has to settle on its foundation, has to stuff itself with so much life, there's no need to beg for more. Triscuits, I tell him, get me bird seed and eggshells and shards of ice. I want to break something on my teeth. I want to crush it so fine the load goes down like abracadabra. Alakazam, watch me make the whole thing disappear. Helen of Troy has always been a deeply frustrating character to me. Even when I was a child obsessed with the Greek mythology and the Troy mythos running in and out of the Memphis public library buildings, reading books that were probably way too mature for me. Um, I loved Greece. I loved the Troy story. And when I first started writing creatively as a child and first started writing poems as a teenager and an adult, some of the first things I wrote were about Greece, about Troy, um, in the voices of women from the Iliad. I wrote poems from the voices of Andromache and Cassandra and Clytemnestra, but never Helen. I left Helen alone on purpose because she bothered me. Helen starts her story as princess of Sparta, becomes queen of Sparta after she marries Menelaus, um, is taken out of Sparta by Paris, or perhaps runs away with Paris, becomes princess of Troy, spends 10 years behind the walls of Troy in safety and luxury, while a massive war is fought over her own person, 
that ends the age of heroes in Greece. And at the end of the war, as Troy is destroyed, she's taken out of Troy and brought back to Sparta to reclaim her throne as queen of Sparta. While all the other women around her, all of the people she spent 10 years behind the walls with, are either slain or enslaved. But not Helen. Helen ends the war in safety. Um, and that frustrated me. I felt that 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 wasn't a fair ending. That wasn't a satisfying ending for the story of Helen of Troy. So when I was writing pieces about Troy or about Greece, I always I left Helen alone until the summer of 2021, when out of nowhere, I dove for my notebook and wrote seven Helen poems in a row. But the voice that emerged had nothing to do with Bronze Age Greece. It was, it was familiar. It was like a woman I might have met at the grocery store or the bank in my own childhood in early 90s Tennessee. And this, this, this cliff edge, desperate, frustrated housewife kind of marched onto the page and introduced herself and basically told me that all I had to do was keep writing until she was done telling her story. And out of that process came my, my debut poetry collection, which was really exciting, but also out of that process, out of that experience, I um, transformed my relationship with Helen as a character. I'm now a huge fan of Helen. I feel like I understand her very deeply. I understand that Helen's story is about a person who doesn't have any choices to make, a person who has no agency and is acted on throughout the whole um, story of Troy. Uh, some of the poems I wrote for this book um, engaged more seriously with an updated version of the Trojan mythology. Some of the poems engaged with um, the world of early 90s Tennessee in, in a way that was really exciting to, to write. I think I'll read one of those poems right now. This one is called Helen of Troy Watches Jurassic Park in Theaters. A month ago, it was horses, 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 but the moon turned and the kid was red-eye rabbit on shovels and dirt, Egyptology, archaeology, paleontology, blitzed all to hell on dead crap, somebody stuck in a hole and forgot about, and then what should hit the local cineplex but dinosaurs cavorting in dazzles of CGI glory, I mean, it was inescapable, T-Rexes plastered on every bus bench from here to Hosanna, and the kid threatening a hunger strike if I didn't bring her opening night, and then somehow the big cheese entered the spirit of the thing, but only, I think, because he got wind of the carnage lurking within, although naturally he didn't give me the slightest whisper of warning until we were an hour in, and the Tyrannosaur was snapping up its first victim like the last ham cube at your cousin's baby shower. I mean blood everywhere. And you know what? I couldn't look away. It was a total Saturday night gore fest, and I was hooked, okay? I was invested. I was cheering that damn lizard on while it chased on all those folks with their miserable problems and unhappinesses and inane little cruelties shared over the dinner table like it's amazing how you spent $30 on blue jeans instead of getting the vacuum fixed. It stomped them flat like good night, like sweet dreams and sayonara. And it was a full eight minutes before I noticed the kid was over there in total convulsions of terror and dread, all googly-eyed and weeping. And I did care. I'm not a monster. Any other second, I'd be right there scooping her up and dashing for the lobby and hugging, kissing and squeezing and so forth, etc but right then, I wasn't me at all. I wasn't mama. I wasn't woman. I wasn't Helen. I was yellow teeth at night. I was rip and tear and mouth of blood. I was something so large. I shook the earth, unpinnable, unappeasable, intractable. I was this thing no one would ever dare call beautiful. And eventually it was the big cheese who grabbed her up and shoved past me down the aisle, carrying our child to safety, while on screen I roared and snapped, and everyone around me bowed. So I think I, I mentioned earlier that I've come to see the Trojan War as the story of a woman who doesn't get to make a lot of choices. Um, and when I was writing Helen of Troy 1993, I wanted to rewrite that narrative. I wanted to give Helen every choice. 
So in this book, it's Helen's choice to marry Menelaus. It's Helen's choice to start an affair with Paris and leave Sparta. And it's Helen's choice to end the affair with Paris and come home to Sparta. And I also wanted to make Helen the decider in the most famous Trojan choice of all, the judgment of Paris. Um, I'm imagining that uh, a lot of people watching this recording are probably already familiar with the mythology of the judgment of Paris, but just in case the ultra brief version of this with no backstory whatsoever is that three goddesses, Athena, Hera, and Aphrodite came to a Trojan hillside to ask the Trojan prince Paris to tell them which of the three was the most beautiful. Each of the goddesses tried to bribe Paris to get him to choose them as the most beautiful. Aphrodite bribed Paris by saying, if you choose me, I will give you the hand of the most beautiful woman in the world to be your wife. Paris, of course, immediately chose Aphrodite. Aphrodite said, okay, go and fetch Helen of Troy out of Sparta. Um, and that launched the entire Trojan War. But of course, what struck me about that story is that um, no one asked Helen whether she wanted to be the prize in a beauty contest among immortals. So when I was writing this book, I knew that that was a myth I wanted to engage with and give Helen the choice, make Helen choose which of the three goddesses was her choice. Um, so this poem is called Helen of Troy's Turn to Judge. Much later, when the clothes were washed and dried, three women came in their nakedness so I could choose from among them the most beautiful. I should say the cat had just pissed on the carpet. Our old cat, a fighting Tom, come in from the wars, and so when the women found me, I was hunched on my knees, pressing paper towels into the shag, the bright crack of ammonia through the air like a train whistle. I wasn't afraid. The women no longer looked like me, so I no longer longed to hurt them for it. I should say that by then the world was already dead. My brothers and cousins, the boys I knew at school, a great cloud that lowered itself across the tobacco, threw its shanks against the window glass, opened the earth in short, dark rips. It's best to put pressure where the pool is deepest. Push your hand down firmly while the gold siphons away. A warm, dripping pad you can bag and disappear. The women were holding small white boxes, and the lid of each box spelled out what was inside in a language without subtlety or art. Knowledge, power, sex, this last picked out in rubies and sapphires, a script that shimmered with a strange inner heat, baking the room, unmaking it. The cat leapt to the kitchen table to bat the surface with unsheathed claws. If there is a mystery to which box was chosen, I apologize. I should have said more. I should have said that music rose from the third box in sweeping arias, that the smell of sea air and thunderstorms rolled from beneath the lid. I should have said that I knew the box because it was mine, given to me as a young girl and kept safe beneath my bed ever since. I was angry. I wanted her bleeding, the woman who had stolen from me, who wore a face that was familiar the way a mountain is familiar, loved so long it softens into background blur. I yanked the box from her hands, but she wouldn't let go. We held it together, she and I, our fingers stroking beneath the base. She seemed glad to share the load. It was a heavy box. I'd forgotten the heft of it. 
the way it dragged the lower spine like a tumor or a baby. I wondered if she'd ever looked inside. The woman, was she beautiful? It hardly mattered. She'd already turned away, studying the view with a jeweler's eye. The empty yard, the empty drive, the cat-killed sparrow dragged to the stoop. Thank you so much for your time and attention today. It's been such a treat to be here reading poems from my debut. Uh, the title is Helen of Troy, 1993. Ooh, my blur. Uh, you can pre-order the book um, from my website, mariazacola.com. It's also pinned to my Twitter at Maria Zicola. Thank you so much again to Ron, to the Alaska Quarterly Review, who actually were, I think, maybe even the second, first or second journal to, um, to go ahead and accept and publish one of these Helen poems when I was first writing them and sending them out. So that early vote of confidence meant so much to me. And thank you to Danny and the Anchorage Museum. Um, it's been an honor being here. Thank you.